hello everybody and welcome back to my channel and welcome back for a new book reading i'm gonna to start today um yeah today i'm gonna to start stephen king's cell um for what i know about the story is that there's some kind of virus that affects uh, people's cell phone and it affects the humans as well to a certain extent that they start going crazy and they start killing each other uh, I think they also made a movie uh, about this book um, with John Cusack and Samuel L. Jackson, I think, plays in. I think I had seen the movie a couple of years ago, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, but vaguely, I remember something from it. Um, but anyway, um, so today I'm going to start this one. Uh, it's quite... A decent book it's quite big so yeah let's here we go first um, chapter should be called the pulse the event that came to be known as the pulse began at 9 uh, at excuse me at 3 p.m eastern standard time on the afternoon of october 1 the term was a misnomer of course but within 10 hours of the event most of the scientists capable of pointing this out were either dead or insane the name hardly mattered in any case what mattered was the effect at three o'clock on that day a young man of no particular importance to history came walking almost bouncing east along Boston Street in Boston his name was Clayton Riddle there was an expression of undoubted contentment on his face to go along with the spring in his step from his left hand there swung the handles of an artist's portfolio the kind that closes and latches to make a traveling case twined around the fingers of his right hand was the drawstring of a brown plastic shopping bag with the words small treasures print on it for anyone who cared to read them Inside the bag, swinging back and forth, was a small round object, a present, you might have guessed, and you would have been right. You might further have guessed that this Clayton Riddle was a young man seeking to commemorate some small, or perhaps even not so small, victory with a small treasure, and you would have been right again. The item inside the bag was a rather expensive glass paperweight with a grey haze of dandelion fluff caught in the center. He had bought it on his way back from the Copley Square Hotel to the much humbler Atlantic Avenue Inn where he was staying frightened by the $90, $90 price tag on the paperweight's base, somehow even more frightened by the realization that he could now afford such a thing. Handing his credit card over to the clerk has taken almost physical courage he doubted if he could have done it if the people would had been for himself he would have muttered something about having changed his mind and scuttled out of the shop but it was for sharon sharon liked such things and she still liked him i'm pulling for you baby she'd say the day before he left to boston considering the shit they put each other through over the last year that had touched him and now he wanted to touch her if that was still possible the paperweight was a small thing small treasure but he was sure she'd love that delicate gray haze deep down in the middle of the glass like a pocket fog clay's attention was attracted by the tinkle of an ice cream truck it was parked across from the four seasons hotel which was even grander than the copley square and next to the boston common which rang along Boston for two or three blocks on his side of the street. The words Mr. Softy were printed in rainbow colors over a pair of dancing ice cream cones. Three kids were clustered around the window, book bags on their feet, waiting to receive goodies. Behind them stood a woman in a pantsuit with a poodle on a leash and a couple of teenage girls in lowrider jeans. 
with iPods, iPods um, and earphones that were currently slung around their necks so they could murmur together. Earnestly, no giggles. Clay stood behind him, turning what had been a little group into a short line. He had bought his estranged wife a present. He would stop at Comic Supreme on the way home and buy his son the new issue of Spider-Man. He might as well treat himself as well. He was bursting to tell Sharon his news, but she'd been out of reach until she got home, 3.45 or so. He thought, he thought they would hang around the inn, at least until he talked to her, mostly pacing the confines of his small room and looking at his latched up portfolio. In the meantime, Mr. Softy made an acceptable diversion. The guy in the truck served the three kids at the window. Two deli bars and a monster chocolate and vanilla swirl soft served cone for the big spender in the middle, who was apparently paying for all of them, while he fumbled a rat's nest of dollar bills from the pocket of his fashionable baggy jeans, the woman with the poodle and the parachute dipped into her shoulder bag, came out with her cell phone, woman in parachute would no more leave home without their cell, cell phones than without their AM escorts. And flipped it open. Behind him in the park, a dog barked and someone shouted. It did not sound to Clay like a happy shout, but when he looked over his shoulder, all he could see were few strollers, a dog trotting with a frisbee in his mouth. Weren't they supposed to be on leashes in there? He wondered. Acres of sunny green and inviting shade. It looked like a good place for a man who had just sold his first graphic novel and its sequel, both for an amazing amount of money, to sit and eat a chocolate ice cream cone. When he looked back, the three kids in the baggies were gone and the woman in the power suit was ordering a sundae. One of the two girls behind her had a peppermint colored phone clipped to her hip and the woman in the power suit had hers screwed into her ear. Clay thought as he almost always did one level of his mind on another when he saw a variation of this behavior that he was watching an act which would once have been considered almost insufferable rude yes even while engaging in a small bit of commerce with a total stranger becoming a part of an accepted everyday behavior put it in dark wonder sweetheart sharon said the version of her he kept in his mind spoke often and was bound to have her say. This was true of the real world, Karen, as well. Separation of no separation or no separation, although not on his cell phone. Clay didn't own one. The peppermint colored phone played the opening notes of that crazy frog dream that Johnny loved. Was it called Axel F? Clay can, Clay can remember, perhaps because he had blocked it out. The girl to whom the phone belonged to snatched it off her hip and said, Bet. She listened, smiled, and then said to her companion, It's bet. Now the other girl bent forward, and they both listened. Nearly identical pixie haircuts. To Clay, they looked almost like Saturday morning cartoon characters, the Powerpuff Girls, maybe, blown together in afternoon breeze. Maddie? said the woman in the power suit at almost exactly the same time. Her poodle was now sitting contemplatively at the end of its leech. The leech was red and dusted with glittery stuff, looking at the traffic at Bolson Street. Across the way at the Four Seasons, a doorman in a brown uniform, they always seemed to be brown or blue, was waving probably for a taxi, a dog boat cramped with tourists sailed by looking high and out of place on dry land. The driver bawling into his loud hailer about something historic. The two girls listening to the peppermint colored phone looked at each other and smiled at something they were hearing, but still did not giggle. Maddie, can you hear me? Can you? The woman in the power suit raised the hand, 
holding the leash and plugged a long kneeled finger into her free ear. Clear winched. Fearing for her eardrum. He imagined drawing her the dog on the leash, the power suit, the fashionable short hair, and one small trickle of blood from around the finger in her ear. The dog boot just excited the frame, exiting the frame and the doorman in the background. Those things somehow lending the sketch is very I can't even pronounce that word. Sorry about that, people. It's a word I haven't seen before, so my apologies. Um, they would, it was just a thing you knew. Maddie, you're, you're breaking up. I just want to tell you, I, I got my hair done at that new... My hair? My... The guy in the Mr. Softy truck bent down and held out a Sunday cup from which rose a white alp with chocolate and strawberry sauce, cursing down its sides. His beard stubbly face was impassive. It said he'd seen it all before. Clay was sure he had, most of it twice. In the park, someone screamed. Clay looked over his shoulder again, telling himself that had to be a scream of joy. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, a sunny afternoon on the Boston Common, it's pretty much had to be a scream of joy, right? The woman said something unintelligible. Intelligible to Maddie and flipped her cell phone closed to practice flip of the wrist. She dropped it back into her purse, then just stood there as if she had forgotten what she was doing or maybe even where she was. That's 450, said the Mr. Softy guy, still patiently holding out the ice cream sundae. Clay had time to think how fucking expensive everything was in the city. Perhaps the woman in the power suit thought so too. That, at least, was his first sermon. Because for a moment more, she still did nothing. Merely looked at the cup with mounts of ice cream, sliding sauce, as if she had never seen such a thing before. Then there came another cry from the common. Not a human one this time, but something between surprised yelp or hurl a yowl. Clay turned to look and saw the dog that had been trotting with a frisbee in his mouth. It was a good sized brown dog, maybe a Labrador. He didn't really know dogs, but he needed to draw one. He got a book and copied a picture. The man in the business suit was down on his knees beside this one and had it in the neck hold and appeared to be, surely I'm not seeing what I think I'm seeing. Clay thought, chewing on its ear. Then the dog howled again and tried to spurt away. The man in the business suit held it firm and yes, that was the dog's ear in the man's mouth. And as Clay continued to watch, the man tore it off the side of the dog's head. This time the dog uttered an almost human scream. And a number of ducks which had been floating on a nearby pond took flight squeaking. Rest, someone cried from behind Clay. It sounded like rest? It might have been rat or roast, but later experience made him lean toward rest. Not a word at all, but merely an, an articulate sound of aggression. He turned back towards the ice cream truck in time to see parachute woman lunch through the serving window in an effort to grab Mr. Softy's guy. He managed to snag the loose folds at the front of his white tunic. By his single startle step, backward was enough to break her hold. Her high heels briefly left the sidewalk, and he heard the rasp of clothes, of cloth, and the clink of buttons at the front of her jacket ran first up the little jut of the service window counter, and then back down. The Sunday tumbled from view. Clay saw a smear of ice cream and sauce on the power suit woman's left wrist and forearm as her high heels clacked back to the sidewalk. She staggered her knees bent, to closed off well bred out of public look on her face. What Clay thought of as your basic on the street no face look had been replaced by 
convulsive snarl that shrank her eyes to slits and exposed both sets of teeth. Her upper lip had turned completely inside out, revealing a pink velvet lining as intimidate as a vulva. Caputo ran into the street, into the street, trailing its red leash with the hand loop in the end. A black limo came along and ran the po poodle down before it got halfway across. Fluff at one moment, guts at the end. Poor damn thing was probably yapping in doggy heaven before it knew it was dead, Clay thought. He understood in some clinical way he was in shock, but that in no way changed the depth of his amazement. He stood there with his portfolio hanging from one hand and his brown shopping bag hanging from another and his mouth hanging open. Somewhere it sounded like maybe around the corner of Newberry Street, something exploded. Well, this is going to be my first part of this book reading. Hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you very much for listening, and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>